And you're going to tell me a story. Yes, I've got a story for you. So uh, what, I, what I do is just mute myself and it's up to you. Right? Okay. Cool. Okay. So the story behind the story is that um, this is a story from India, but it was told to me by Jan Blake. So it's, I like that because the story came to me from outside of India. Um, and then after I told the story the first time, I told it to my um, family. And they looked at me and they said, we know the story already. So I was like, huh? How come I don't know it? Like, well, our grandfather, he used to love the story. So apparently the story is something that my family knows about and I had to come all the way to the UK to discover the story via meeting Jan. <laughs> so here goes. There was once a potter and this potter came from a long line of potters. His father was a potter, his grandfather, his great grandfather, his whole caste was of a caste that made mud pots. And this was not a small thing because uh, pots are an essential item in India. You have pots to fill water, you have pots in which you store water, you have pots in which you store grain. Pots are everywhere in the kitchen. So the potter was from a pretty important caste. Now, the thing was, it just wasn't an ordinary caste of potters. His family and the skill of his family was legendary. Everyone knew how his great, great, great grandfather had found the special red clay whose secret he wouldn't reveal. And everyone knew how his grandfather had mastered the art of baking and layering those pots so finely that they looked fit for the king himself. And they trained our potter. So by the time the potter was, you know, he went into his profession, as we call it, <laughs> he felt in a way quite privileged, but also a little bit frustrated because there was nothing else left for him to do. Everything his forefathers had already done. What could he do to spread the fame and the name of his um, caste far and wide? So he thought and he thought, he got it. He went deep into the forest one day and he sat there in tapasya, in meditation, praying to Lord Shiva and he had a specific blessing he wanted from Shiva. So there he was on one foot standing under a great banyan tree praying and he prayed and he prayed. He was so still that the ants, they began to create an anthill and the anthill rose up to his ankles, but he didn't flinch. As years went by, the anthill rose to his knees. He didn't even feel it. And then up to his hips, his chest, he was fixed on Shiva. The anthill rose higher and higher till it reached his chin. And then there was a little shimmering and a soft wind blew past and smelt it. That familiar smell of burnt ash and sweat. And he opened his eyes and of course there was the great blue god himself, Shiva, standing right in front of him, Neil Kant. Bah, water, bah. This is amazing. I am pleased. Ask me what you would like. All I have prayed for and all I want is just one thing. Grant me the blessing to make an 
unbreakable pot. That's an unusual request. Are you sure? Of course, I have had thousands of years maybe to think about it. Remember, Potter, once I give you the blessing, it cannot be taken back. Think about it really carefully. Oh, I have thought about it. That's all I want. I just want it in the name of my family. Done. And there was a shimmering and a cold wind blew past and Shiva was gone. The potter, he hopped and skipped all the way home. As soon as he got home, he found his clay that had been untouched for all those years. He picked it up one wet lump and he began to mold it. And he molded and molded a fine pot indeed he had. He baked it overnight. And the next morning, he skipped to the oven. He took it out. He put some water around it till he could finally hold it. It was a fine pot indeed, just an ordinary pot. And then he picked it up and right there in his courtyard was a beautiful, old, sturdy mango tree. He took the pot and he smashed it against that tree. And then he ducked because the pot came right back at him. He reached out, he grabbed the pot from the ground, examined it inch by inch, every little bit. You guessed it. There wasn't a scratch. Yippee! He thought he picked up some more clay. He molded another pot, a fine pot. This time a little thinner, a little taller, a little more delicate. He jumped, he went right up to the roof of his house. And from there, you guessed it, he threw it right down with all the force he could. And then he had to step back because the pot bounced back and he caught it, he examined it. Not a scratch. Oh, he was joyful. Har Har Mahadev, he said, glory to Shiva. And this time he went down, he picked up that muddy clay and he began to mold the most delicate, the finest, tiniest pot he could have made. It was almost translucent. The light went through it. It was so thin and so delicate. And once it was baked and ready, he took it into the house to where his wife's stone, grinding stone was. And there he smashed that pot onto the grinding stone. The pot was unharmed. The grinding stone had a huge cut through it. His wife wasn't very happy, but the potter, all his dreams had been achieved. He set up a big board with a shop that said, Har Har Mahadev and Sons, and he began to sell his unbreakable pots. Now you can imagine what happened once the word went out. Everyone wanted a pot. There was a huge long line and soon he had a waiting list of a year's orders because, well, think about it. Who wants a breakable pot when you can have an unbreakable pot, right? So a year went past and the potter was busy. Everyone knew Har Har Mahadev and sons. He knew he had done his duty towards his ancestors. And as the year went past, well, he began to notice something. The orders weren't flooding in. And you know the line outside that shop? Well, instead of 100 people waiting, then there were 50, then there were 15, then there were five, then probably just one. And he had lost his pot. So he wanted another unbreakable pot. Soon he had no work. And now he sat in his big mansion with marble floors and gold lettering of his family's name. But all day long, he just swung on a swing, right and left, forward and backward. 
And he looked at his hands. Who am I, he thought. I am a rich man. I am of the potter caste. But I make no pots. Who am I? I am a potter. And so this time, for a second time, he went out deep into the forest. You know that tree with the banyan tree up above. You know what he did. He stood on his leg. You know what happened. And those ants, they knew a familiar smell. And soon he was praying and the ants were building a new home. And it went up to his ankles and then his knees and then his hips and then his chest. And the ant hill rose higher and higher till there was a shimmering and a cool wind with a familiar smell of ash and sweat. Har Har Mahadev, he said to Shiva, Please, sir, I have made a mistake. Please take this blessing away. It's a curse. I just want to make pots. I warned you, Potter. Once a blessing is given, it can't be taken back. All right, then. Mahadev, just grant me this one blessing. Let me make breakable pots. Done. And there was a shimmering and a cold wind. And Shiva was gone. And the potter walked back to his village and to his family to teach his sons his grandsons, his daughters, and his granddaughters the secret of a breakable pot. And that is the story. I understand your grandfather. It's a <laughs> beautiful story. I really, really... And once you sort of get it, it's, it, it, it still continues being really full of surprises. <laughs> really, yeah. really good. Thank you so much. It was good. And you say Shiva. You say Shiva. 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 It's uh, Shiva is, we say Shiv. Okay. It's a smaller E. It's not Shiva. No. Uh, and he's, of course, all our main gods have a thousand names. So Shiva has so many names, yeah. um, mainly like their praise names, as you might call them in Viking uh, lore, possibly. Okay. So he's Mahadev, which means great God. He's Nilkant, which means the one with the blue throat. And there are equally other names. So. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I was just into Brahma. Uh, Shiva and Vishnu. That was sort of, uh, in, <laughs> that's when I get, so, whoa, now that there's a lot of people to, uh, gods to remember. But but I did some work there once with uh, Ramayana. It was really, really good. I loved it. I, I loved yeah. To, to dive into these old stories. Yeah, yeah. Thank... We are populated with mythology. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't have three gods, by the way, Sven. We have six million. So there's uh, a couple of million for you to get to know yet. Yeah, yeah it's true. And, and when you talk about time, it's always like that. He stands there for 1,000 years, maybe 2,000 years. But when he comes back to his kitchen, the clay is still waiting for him. And it's, it's one yeah. of them. Well, I was, uh, the other night I was talking to... Um, to a uh, guy from Bangladesh who is now living in, in, in uh, Sweden. And he told me about the mango tree. And uh, I was quite surprised about that. He said that the way to find out whether or not a mango is ripe, the color, I mean, there's a lot of them that change color into orange, and then it's time you can go and pick them. But there are mangoes that stay green. And how do you how do you know how to, to find out when, when to go and get them? Of course. How? My grandfather was appalled. I went to live with him when I was about 15 after my, I finished my school. So I had 
I was studying where my grandfather was. And um, it was just him in the house, right? So I was helping him take care of the house as well. And one of the first things he asked me to do was to go to the market and get some mangoes because it was summer. Um, and I said, how do I buy mangoes? Do you want green ones? Do you want orange ones? And he was appalled. He was like, you don't know how to buy a good mango. So for the next month, he would come with me to the market and we would go through different types of mangoes and he would show me. It was like this training in choosing a good mango. <laughs> That's beautiful. I like your grandfather. He's a good guy. <laughs> he a lot of good stories. Yes. <laughs> he was quite a guy. <laughs> Uh, this guy from Bangladesh told me that uh, he, he went, they were on the trees and, and the way to see whether or not a green mango was ripe was to see when the birds started eating them. Yeah. So when the but birds... if you buy them in the market, Sven, here's a secret. If you buy them in the market, always try and buy a greenish mango rather than an orange mango. Uh, if you're buying like, you know, five or six, because then you bring the mangoes home and over the week they will ripen in your house. Okay, cool. And as they turn orange, you start eating them. The, st the story that this reminded me of, I, that it was when he was in the middle of the forest. He was standing there told a tree and there was these ants coming to, up and there was all this life. And I saw suddenly a deer passing by, a little deer, a, a, a female deer just passing by. And that is the story why there are no tigers on uh, in Borneo. And the reason oh. there are no tigers in Borneo, because it's true, there were no tigers in Borneo. Now there's no tigers anywhere. But before that, there was a lot of tigers in Sumatra, but there were no tigers in Borneo. So the, the, the king of the tigers of Sumatra said, swim over to Borneo and find out if, if what, what this king of the tigers, if we can meet him and talk to him about coming. We are so overpopulated with tigers in Sumatra. Maybe some of us can live in Borneo. And they swam over and they step on, on, on the beach there. And there was this little, little deer, a female deer looking and she had never seen a tiger before, but she knew that was trouble. I mean, you could see mm. them whiskers, big whiskers, big mouths and the stripes. And there were these teeth. And she was like, oh, hello. How are you? Welcome to Borneo. <laughs> and the tiger said, can we talk to your king? The tiger king, we would like to meet him here on the beach. Go and go and get him. And she was like, yeah, 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 I will do that. So she turned around and she started running. And then she saw the man with the, who was standing there, you know, your potter, who was standing there with all the ants coming up. That's when I saw her passing by. But there's total panic. There was total panic in her eyes, in, in her heart, because she knew two things, right? There, there, there was no tiger king in, 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 in Borneo. And the second was that these tigers were going to eat her when, when she was coming back, right? So she was totally in shock and totally in panic. So she met this, um, are you calling it a porcupine? Yeah, the porcupine, yeah. And she met this, a good friend of hers. And he was like, hey, stop, what's going on here? And yeah, she was like, there's a body, there's a Please, please calm down. What is it? She was like, oh, yes, 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 yes. You know, we, we don't have any tigers, you know. Yeah, I know that. Um, everybody knows that no tigers in Borneo. But, but there are tigers from Sumatra now coming and they want to meet the king of the tigers of Borneo. What, what should we do? They're going to eat me. I don't, know. I don't want to be eaten. Well, first, relax and think. Relax and think. You know the solution is right there in front of your eyes and it's just a question of relax, feel the ground and she was grounded and she looked at the porcupine and do you know the porcupines had these big sticks yeah 
And she remembered the tiger's whiskers. Ah. ah, yes, she said. Can I borrow? Oh, I mean, can I have one of your, your sticks there? Yeah, and she grabbed it, had it by the mouth and came running back to the beach to all these big tigers of Sumatra, placed the big stick there and said, oh, I'm so sorry, but the tiger, the king of the tigers of Borneo is busy at the moment, but he will meet you later this afternoon if you will, if, if you will let him. I just brought uh, one of his whiskers so you could see how big he is, but please, be here in the afternoon and he will come. And they looked at this and <laughs> the size of, and they imagined the tiger is like <laughs> and they just said, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine, we'll find another place and then they turn around and swam back to Sumatra. And that is why there are no tigers in Borneo. Oh, that's so cool. That is that's good. Huh. Yeah. Huh. The, do, you, do you know the story called The Tiger's Whisker? Oh, uh, yeah. No, no. no. <laughs> I should know it. I mean, I know this story. Uh, would, would you like to tell that? <laughs> it's, you know, as soon as you talked about the porcupine quill, I was like, The Tiger's Whisker. The That's what's going on in my head. What did you say? The porcupine quill? Uh, it's called a quill, that thing oh. that she got from the porcupine. It's still uh, not my native language, this English, <laughs> so I'm still working on it. But go for that story. I mean, Gauri, come on. Yeah, you think? Okay, that's interesting because this story is rather special. I first heard it as the tiger's whisker and that it is a story that comes from South Korea. Um, but subsequently, I was working with a group of refugee women and I told them the story. Um, and one of them who was from Sudan, uh, she turned around and said, I know that story. We know it as the hair of the lion. So I, I'm just finding it fascinating how the stories are going around the world today. <laughs> and now I have one from Borneo. Okay. So the tiger's whisker from South Korea. Hmm. There was once a woman whose husband had gone off to wars. He was a soldier. And when he came back from the wars, she didn't recognize him. In the beginning, he was just moody and irritable. But as time went past, she actually began to get a little bit worried about him. And then, well, the first time he beat her, that's when she knew he, she was actually afraid, afraid of who this stranger had come to his house in, in the shape of her husband. And she tried to be patient. She tried to, you know, kind of be good to him. But something that had turned in his chest so she knew what she had to do. She went to the old medicine woman on the edge of her village. And this old woman, she heard the footsteps. And before the young wife arrived, she knew who it was. And the old woman, well, you know how old women at the edge of the villages are in stories. She was cooking and brewing an evil smelling broth in one corner of her house with cobwebs and as the door opened she didn't even look back and she said come in come in now, nobody goes to the old woman unless it's something serious so you know uh, our young wife she steps into the hut and she looks around she crinkles up her nose it's smelling but it's no worse than what she has at home so she sits and she sat and she sat and she was patient. And after what seemed like hours, the woman turned to her and said, well, you have a problem, I hear. 
Oh yes, oh yes, you you must know about it already. Ah, husband not treating you well, is it? It's not just that, she said. Uh, something's changed about him. Something is really wrong. And I have fear in my heart. How can I live with a man who I'm afraid of? Hmm. That is a problem. And the old woman, she thought about it and she said, that is a really big problem. Tell you what, I do have a medicine, but you're going to have to get me a tiger's whisker. Uh, excuse me? A tiger's whisker from a live tiger. Not one of those dead, smelly, flim-flam ones. <laughs> if the young wife thought she had a problem at home, this was a problem she couldn't even begin to imagine. So, you know what? She said, this is the way it is. This is the way I'm going to do it. So she said, I'll get you that whatever you want. A tiger's whisker. Don't forget. And she went out. She went deep into the forest, first of all, to find a tiger. And she did. There was a cave. And by the smell that only people who live next to a forest know, she knew there was a tiger living in there. So now she had a tiger. Now she had to get a whisker. <laughs> small step, you know, just that small step. So she went back home and she cooked a meal. She fed her husband and the remaining meal, a nice live chicken that had been slaughtered that day would be something a tiger would like, she hoped. And she took it and gingerly she placed the bowl just with a stick. She pushed it close to the cave and she hid up a tree just outside the cave. She waited for hours. And finally, when it was dusk, as night was falling, she saw two glowing green eyes coming out of the cave, getting closer and closer. And then they seemed to stop. And they seemed to smell something. And what she hoped happened, the tiger came out, went to this bowl and lapped it up. And once it had its first meal, it lolloped off into the forest. She climbed back down, she got the bowl, she ran as fast as her legs would carry her back to her house. <sighs> that worked, that wasn't so bad. And so the next day and the day after that, and for as many days as it would take, she would go with a bowl of food every evening. And every evening, the tiger would come, it would eat. And as days went past, the tiger wouldn't just eat, it began to look around. And then one day, his eyes met hers. And she was trembling, the branches of the tree were trembling. But the tiger just looked at her and then went away. And the next day, the tiger's eyes caught hers immediately and the branches of the tree didn't shake. And the third day, she came down and she stood in front of the tiger. And as days went past, the tiger began to approach her, would smell her. And then one day, she mustered up all the courage and she stroked that tiger. And you know how it is when a big cat just sits there as you stroke it. And day after day, she would come, she would feed the tiger and she would stroke the tiger and she would talk to the tiger. And the tiger would lie there like a pussy cat. A very, very strange friendship developed. And one day she looked at the tiger sleeping in her lap and she said, I'm sorry, I must do this. Will you let me take a whisker, just one for my husband? 
The tiger simply looked at her and then closed its eyes. And quietly she took a knife and she broke off a whisker as quickly as she could. The tiger didn't flinch. Oh, I'm glad I didn't hurt you, she said. And that day when the tiger left, she took that whisker and she ran with all the breath she had in her body back to the old woman. I got it, she said, I got it. She burst into the room. Wait, wait, wait. All good things take time. I got the whisker, I got the whisker, she said. And the old woman, she took that whisker, she looked at me. That's a fine cat indeed. Hmm. And she went to the fire where her pot was bubbling. She threw that whisker into the fire and watched it burn. What are you doing? That's the whisker. I need my medicine, please. Ah, little girl, she said. What are you worried about? you got a tiger to give you his whisker. Over time, the tiger in your house will find a way to give you his. And with that, the old woman gave a hug to the young one and said, go in peace. And that's the story of the tiger's whisker. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Whoa. I feel, yeah. I've, I only wish my cats would let me take a whisker. Oh, with yeah. Such ease. <laughs> yeah. Five years and counting. It, it's very strange. When you, when you said that he was, he was hurting her, I was just going straight to my 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 uh, my daughter because she said recently daddy i didn't understand what you were saying when you were, we were about we were teenagers and i just said to them once he touch you once and you're leaving you're just out of there you just leave whatever leave whatever behind don't care about it he would always come with another excuse and he would do blah 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 mm. blah, blah blah but once mm. never once you will, it will not happen. But if he does, just get out, just leave, mm. run away. And she said, I never understood it when I was a teenager, but I understood it, stand it now because, you know, she sees that, that none of her friends have anything like that, but it's, it's really striking. It's, it's, it's yeah. deep in my heart to hear that some men will do that. It's really like, oh, wow. It's, it's such a, you know, the first time I heard it, I was flinching. And then when the Sudanese woman told me, we know the story, yeah. that's when I understood what a woman's story this is. Yeah. Uh, you know, and how it's, it's something that just moves across cultures. Yeah. I'm not sure there was ever any trade or traffic between South Korea and Sudan. I could be wrong. Mm. But the archetypes, the motifs, they are the same. The, the fears are the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. I had prepared a story for you, but that's going to be the last because there's only four stories. Yes, four. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, and the story is about a wife and a man. And uh, they are in a very, very different position because what you told about this soldier coming back from the war and he's told it changed. That is also a scar right into to, to my wounds. I've seen Denmark go into war and I never understood a word what was going on. And I heard of these soldiers being totally transformed by being soldiers. Mm -hmm. well, how can you ever imagine going to war and come back again and the world is the same? Of course it's not. It's a mm -hmm different one but these two were farmers and they were happy together they had one horse and that horse was very good when they were plowing and they were good at all kinds of things but there was a lot of things that the horse of course couldn't do for instance give milk and they were sort of 
finding out ways to plow and do other things. So they decided together that we could, uh, you can bring the cow into market, she said, uh, and then sell the horse and then you will buy things for us that you think we will need. I will do that, he said. So next day he took the horse and he started walking and he gave her a kiss first and then waved to her and off he went. You know, Denmark is a very flat country. So this road just went on and on and on, turned a little to the left. And there in front of a barn stood a, stood a man and he said, ah, a fine horse you got there. Yeah, I'm on my way to the market. I'm, I'm going to have some money and I will buy different things. So the man in front of the barn said, would you, um, I have a cow in there. Would you, would you like to swap the cow for the, for the horse? Oh, said the man, that's nice. <laughs> My wife, we need milk and for milk we can get butter. We can get, oh, that's fine. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, swap the horse for the cow. So he got the cow, it's, the otters were really like full of milk and he could see that this horse was really a good bargain. So he went on. And there stood a man with a goat on the side of the road and looked at the cow and said, that's a beautiful cow you got there. Yeah, but it's a nice goat you got there. Yeah, it has two. We think it's two small goats inside of her and there's some milk and, uh, you know, you know, with goat. Oh, and he f the man thought about it a little. Oh, that could be nice, right? Yeah, a, 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 a stew made out of goat meat. That's very special. It's very good. And goat cheese as well. So they swapped. So he was on his way with his pregnant goat. And there was this man standing by the side of the road with a sheep. And he said, well, it's a very fine goat you got there. Yeah, I'm on my way to the market to sell it. And then after a while, it was like, oh, yeah, mm, a sheep, right? A sweater of, of, of yes, <laughs> and socks. Well, we swapped. And then he met a man with a hen and they swapped because of eggs, you know. And then he met a man with a big barrel of horse manure, horse shit. And he was going on, <clears throat> my wife talked about it the other day that do you know what is the best for tomatoes? Do you know what that is? That's horse shit. Give it horse shit and they grow like this and they are so ripe and fresh and full of... <laughs> So they swapped. He got the horse shit and he had it in his pockets, big, big pockets. Everywhere it was horse shit. So now he had made the deal, right? He could just as well go home, but now he was in the marketplace. And one of the things when you have made a good bargain, you go into a little pop and had a beer or a little dram, you know, and celebrate your bargain. Luckily, he had money with him from home because he got no money from the horse. So he paid himself a dram and he was sitting there. And in Danish story, if you hear that there is an Englishman, you know that they're going to be fooled. That's always like that. Englishmen, we fool them always. We don't, I don't know why, but they do it like that. So there were two Englishmen sitting there and, you know, he was sitting next to the fire. And of course, <laughs> oh God. Oh, yeah, what's this? It's a smell of horse shit. Oh, well, oh, dear. Oh, is that from your pants? And he said, yes, they're from her pants. Yes, that's horse shit. I, 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 I left with a horse and now I come back with horse shit. <laughs> your wife is going to be crazy about her. She's going to, she's going to hit you for that. I mean, she's going to give you so much. I mean, why did you do that? And he told the whole story. And then they got, and he was still happy. It sounded like he was so convinced that she was going to be happy. So they made, they made a, a little bet right there. We have two bags of small bags of gold. You can have them if she's friendly to you, if she's nice to you when you come home with your horse ship. And he didn't really have anything to go back with the bargain, but he said, you can, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure. Don't, don't bother. Come with me home. 
So they went home and there she stood waiting. And when he, she saw that there were two men with him, he went, she went, oh, just a moment. I will go and make some more potatoes and the dinner ref, ready in, in, in a few moments. And then she came out. Oh, <clears throat> what happened to the horse? Yeah, I sold it. Lovely, lovely. What did you, what did you sell it for? A cow. Lovely. My, yes. <laughs> We're going to have cow milk. Beautiful. I'm going to make butter. Yes, I'm very good at that. And it's going to be fine. We're going to sell the butter and we're going to be rich. My lovely husband, I love you so much. And then he said, well, I actually swapped the, 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 the cow for a goat. A goat? Dearest man, that's so wonderful. You know how much I love it. You know it as well, right? A stew made out of goat meat. That's just some of the best. And the goat cheese as well. Lovely husband. You are so clever. Yeah, but um, I went further on and then I uh, swapped the goat for a sheep. A sheep? Have I heard this? Uh, you know, I can make a sweater for you. You're always cold in the winter time. You've said it so many times. And I can make my socks because I'm always cold on my feet. You're a darling. And then he said, well, I swapped the sheep for a hen. Lay an egg, you know. You are wonderful, my darling. A hen, then we can get the neighbor's rooster and we can have chickens and it will grow for us. You are what? I will make you an omelette tomorrow morning. I'll tell you. And then he said, well, I swapped the hen for some horse shit. The tomatoes. We had talked about it yesterday. You're so clever. But you know what? My the neighbor, you know the neighbors? Yeah, we always arguing and talking. And this morning I was so angry with her that I thought, oh, I wish I had some shit to throw in her head. And you come with the shit, my darling. Mm. And she gave her him a kiss, turned around and went in and did the, fifth, the last of the dinner. So he turned around to these two Englishmen that were just standing like, you, you, you definitely deserve the two gold bags. And now he said the dinner was ready and they had a wonderful time, the four of them for the whole night. <laughs> Oh, what a great story. Oh, man. Talk about, you know, being content with what you have. Yeah, yeah exactly. Amazing. Gosh, thank you. Thank you. This, this story with the shit in the end is, is a folk traditional story. The, the story is quite famous in Denmark. It's called What daddy does is always the right it's from hans christian anderson yes. uh -huh. so so that version hans christian anderson version is very famous but this version right. is is one that i really like because it sort of takes it a little deeper it's it's not rot i think he ends up in rotten apples and and, and it makes sounds but but i mean i love this that these two englishmen is sitting there like, yeah yeah oh Dear, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> you did a really good English man there. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've, I've been practicing all morning with that. <laughs> so cool. Thank you so much. That was a duet with. Thank you. That oh, was God. that was so much fun. It's and, so fun uh, to have you around. Yeah. Thank you for your stories because I was a bit nervous about whether I would find links, but I found a link earlier than I should have. No. I mean, it's one of the things about this. It's organic, right? It's two people and we're talking and then we get inspired. And that was just, thank you so much. I'm looking so much forward to see you in real life. Yeah. It yeah. might happen during the autumn, right? Uh, I hope before autumn. I'm hoping it would be the first week of August. Ah, you, you um, the last bit of the summer here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've I've had enough of hot scorching summers. I want to experience gentle summers, <laughs> so that I'm not. 
we have very hot weather out there now. Yeah. It's really what, like, what's hot, Sven? Uh, if you don't mind me asking. 20, 22, maybe 23. <laughs> what's hot for you? Babies. <laughs> what's Babies. hot for you? Um, 47, 48. <laughs> All right. See you. And have, thank you so See much you. for this. Thank you. Take care. Don't worry. Bye. Bye.